after our last conversation and watching the comment sections and watching the comment sections on other videos by you and by others. Mm -hmm. um, I've been thinking about this because I'm, I'm still very interested in the BSV Bitcoin sphere, but my sense is that there's a certain level where you need a certain technical understanding to understand what's the difference between BTC, between BSV, all of that. Sure. But, but then there is very quickly like a level of, you can then obsess over technical details. And if you're, if you're a tech person, yeah. you need to do that because that's what mm -hmm. will make the system run. But as a more, as an investor and or just somebody who's interested in it, that's not actually what gets you anywhere. And then yeah. I started really coming to this place that I think a lot of the questions people disguise as technical questions are actually philosophical questions. That's like it's, it's very much about, so what is a good economy? What, 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 is, what, is, what does it mean to have a, a solid foundation in the monetary system? And all of those questions are mm -hmm. then disguised as, or oftentimes disguised as technical questions. Oh, could it ever yeah. be more than 21 million? But I think it actually gets to these questions of what's the world viewed through an economic lens we want to live in. Yep. And I, I would, I, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. A, a lot of these things, I mean, Bitcoin, Bitcoin itself is a technical system, but it's a technical system that was built with philosophy underpinning it. It's it's actually just a monetary system and it's a monetary system based on incentives. And it's it's sort of like asking if you can pre-plan an economy. And I, I would argue that it's bad to plan an economy as you go, but the what went into Bitcoin initially was, you know, what what have we learned from the last 10,000 years of global economics? And can we apply all of the good ideas and balance them with incentives and then set them free and let the free market do what it will? And I, I think that's the major disconnect between big blockers and small blockers is that small blockers fundamentally believe that they can build a perfect technical system. They are very, very technocratic. And we're seeing this with the the Taproot upgrade. They're they're super excited that Taproot's coming soon, and they're they're, they're fundamentally changing all kinds of protocols again over on BTC because, well, it's not perfect yet, so we need to keep tinkering. And it's a um, it doesn't make them bad people. It's just it, it is a is a mindset that there is something humans can do to make a perfect system. And then the perfect system will carry us to this, you know, to the promised land, basically. And my contention for that is, well, we've seen people who think this way about economics and we typically look at them as, uh, you know, murderous dictators and, you know, in, in hindsight. And, and, and this goes back to anybody from, yeah, I mean, you can look at Lenin or Marx or, or even uh, you know the the Hitlers and the Mussolinis of the world, or or you can go to Mao Zedong and and say you know if you if you if you read what they write, like it it primarily comes from a place of of hope, and it comes from a place of making a better world for you know either the working man or or the you know whatever your your nationalistic thing is or whatever. But you know they're they're looking at at people as a whole, and they're saying man, if we could just give these people a perfect tool, look, look how much greater the world could be. And, you know, and then at the end of it, you look back 15 years later and it's, well, okay, a few few hundred million people either starved to death or were killed for disobeying and, and all these things because it was about the, the perfection of the system and that the system needed to thrive first. And then the people that are born into the system will be able to just go off and create some incredible thing. And, and we've just never seen that in practice. And we see a subset of that also in fiat economies. This is very much what central banks do too. I mean, they're sitting there trying to pre-plan the perfect interest rates and the perfect distribution of wealth and the perfect amount of circulating capital and all these kind of things. And, you know, and to, to a degree, I mean- completely insane during Corona. Just completely yes. insane. <laughs> yeah, it's bonkers, and and I think a lot of people, you know, fundamentally agree that that's the case, um, especially in, in Bitcoin circles. Like, hey, it's not good that there's another twenty or thirty or forty trillion dollars circulating than there was two years ago. 
But then you go back and, and you say like, you know, I had a debate with a guy about this El Salvador deal and, and BTC and he was like, oh, well, it's, they're going to be more free because of blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, two things. First of all, they're using a, a completely custodial service called Zap in El Salvador. Uh, and, and it's, and it's integrating with a, with a fascist economy. So, I mean, they're, they're the head of state in El Salvador is, is a fascist dictator. And then the other thing is that the thing that you're fundamental that you're giving them, you're telling them is this fundamentally sound, hard money. And it's, it's literally in flux. It is going to be different in November than it is today. And so, <laughs> so we're having these conversations about hard money that can't change. And Bitcoin has never even gone a four year period without a very deep fundamental change in protocol. And so all of this, you mean BTC you know, in this case. Actually, you know, it really depends. There really hasn't been any implementation of Bitcoin that's gone that long. That's I true. mean, even even BSV, the 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 Genesis upgrade was done mm -hmm. via hard fork, and it was not a contentious hard fork. But that was February of 2020. This is yeah. not even two years old now. So, you know, we're, we we keep saying set in stone, or that the Bitcoin protocol was set in stone in in 2009 when it was released, and and all of that, and people just can't stop tinkering with it. I mean, even Satoshi added the, the one megabyte block size limit and he did it unilaterally and, and these kind of things. It's like, well, we understand why it was because of X, Y, and Z. And, and some of these things are, are fair. Like it's not, you know, we're, we're not perfect. Um, but, but the Bitcoin protocol is designed to function within that framework of the fact that we're not perfect, but we are competitive. It is this competitive nature of a free market that secures Bitcoin and gives Bitcoin value as a tool in business. And so it's really hard to get away from these notions, especially among software people. Software people think they can solve everything at their keyboards. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I get that. That's that's what their training tells them to do. And it's even the way mentally that you're wired. You have to be very good at debugging code. I mean, these are the kind of things that, you, I mean, this is hundreds or thousands of hours of line by line. Why did it crash? Can it be more efficient? If I put the wrong word in the wrong spot, is it going to break the entire system? So there is a lot of power and responsibility that goes into that. But with that comes a lot of ego. And, and it's, it's also, I mean, it's exactly what you want a software engineer to do. You want them, yes. you want them to do exactly that. And you want them to also know that the quality of their coding impacts the whole system. The, yes. it, it's when we confuse the coding with the system and that yes. the code is not the system. Precisely. And it, it's, it's the same thing, you know, I mean, we've been having conversations for 10,000 years, frankly, about what is a human? Are we our body? Are we our soul? Are we our mind? Do we have to be a combination of the three? Or, you know, or in, you know, let's say in 200 years when we're all dead and gone, if there's video of me and you talking, like, is that still us? Like, do we still exist? And it's a little bit ethereal. Like, I don't know. There is record of our existence. You can hear our voices. You can see our faces. You can still feel the things that we feel, but we're, we're, we're gone. But are we, you know? So it's, it's, it's exactly that. It's the system versus the parts of the system versus the people that maintain the parts of the system. Uh, and, and I would, would love to just, because we went right in here and I want to yeah. set the context a tiny bit more because yes, so, so it's just from a philosophical perspective, which is funnily enough what I studied. So what I'd like looking at is mm. what do words mean and what, what are we saying with them? I, it seems like you've made a really important distinction that I think is often missed or misunderstood, which is this distinction between a technocratic system and a human based system for yep. lack of a better word where the technocratic system would say, if we get the system right, the humans will follow along. Whereas the human-based system would say, no, humans will never follow along with a system. So let's build the system with that in mind. And yep. I actually, you, you introduced basically perfectly what I would love to do with you today, where you said, Bitcoin has taken these ideas from economy of what has not worked in the past and what has worked in the past and has incentivized that. And I would love to look at those. Like, what are the ideas that are baked into Bitcoin and unpacking that? Because I think that, I that would be really interesting so people can then look at them one by one. Yep. I love it. Let's do it. Wonderful. So 
we had one fundamental distinction already, technocracy, humanocracy. Is, the, is there a word for the other side of technocracy? <laughs> uh, I think freedom, free markets, really. I mean, fr free markets and free people and whatever it is they create is that thing. So maybe we need a word. <laughs> Which is interesting that we have a word for technocracy, but not really. We, there would be capitalism potentially, but then capitalism Maybe. has very many different understandings. Yeah. I think the word, the word capitalism has a lot of baggage. Yes. And for context, anybody watching, uh, the word capitalism was actually a derogatory term created by communists. So communists mm -hmm. view the word capitalism as a criticism, and they're criticizing bank state inflationary monetary policy and, and that kind of thing. And I think actually some of their criticisms are fair. So I, I don't love the word capitalism either, even though in, in many ways I'm, I'm very much capitalist. So it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, we need better words. So, so, so human based system, human freedom. Um, yeah. W w I would I would assume that's a core element of Bitcoin as a system is humans own their Bitcoin, they can do with it what they want. And that's how the economy will be built by one person at a time. Mm -hmm. Can you expand on that? Because I imagine that's a really core tenet. So I, I think, you know, when, when we see what people do with increased freedom and increased access to resources, uh, and, and to a, an extent also um, worldviews that are positive and encouraging, that encourage that kind of thing, as well as, um, you know, just, just even things that you kind of can't bottle up, like just general worldview and, and that kind of thing too. Like, you hear about the Protestant work ethic, for example, and it's like, well, what is that? You know, like, how do you, how do you, how do you quantify the difference between, you know, whatever Catholics or Jews or, or Muslims versus Protestants and how productive are they as people? And is that a worldview thing or is it a function of the fact that most Muslims are in a place that has a different set of resources or, or that kind of thing? So um, there's a lot of weird social science to to go into there or anthropology and and figure some of that stuff out. But I think there's there's definitely an aspect of worldview that is is very relevant there. And that would probably make for a at least a 10 or a 12 hour podcast uh, just to go into some of that and define those things. But I do believe that that worldview is a is a cornerstone of anything that is productive. If you are raised to believe that it's your job to protect your family, build something great, leave the world better than you found it and that kind of thing. And if, you know, then that, that becomes part of your ethos. And then culturally, if you, you, you transplant that, if, if I raise my children to be that way and I make my community feel like that's part of, you know, their goal in life, then you'll generally see more productivity from that group of people. And I think Bitcoin to a degree has, has fostered that, um, it was certainly a big part of the early days, you know, to talk to old monetary activists and cypherpunks and the people on the cryptography mailing list. Uh, I mean, who, who gets into cryptography? I mean, it, it's, it was quite literally, especially that, you know, 12 years ago, it, it was primarily people that were interested in uh, privacy as a, as an aspect of human sovereignty and, and human rights generally. So um, these are the people that created things like PGP keys and and those sorts of system like pu public key cryptography was created by people that believed that humans have the right to communicate across adversarial channels that an open internet is good in many ways, but that spying is an inherent problem of that system and therefore we need encryption to be able to have free people communicate across hostile borders and that kind of thing. So Bitcoin already started with a lot of that sort of background freedom fighter aspect to it. Uh, so much so that the way that Bitcoin uses keys, uh, the, the, the cryptography aspect of Bitcoin uh, isn't even to encrypt the ledger. The ledger is perfectly open. The cryptography aspect of it is about one establishment of identity and saying, these are my keys and I can communicate over these channels with you using my keys as one attestation of my identity and my ownership and to prove what I hold and, and that kind of thing. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff there about 
uh, identity and individual sovereignty and and rights to a system that can't be grabbed arbitrarily. You you can certainly be um, you can be implored, you can be forced. If somebody were to you know break into my home and put a gun to my head, you know, like they they could certainly uh, coerce me to give them my bitcoins. But uh, aside from that, there's not there's not a penetrative way to to break the system that way and. Uh, that is all very ideological. Those are the things that um, we big blockers, this BSV and the BCH people, uh, share with small blockers, the BTC people. That there is a there is a sort of sovereignty to the system, and that ownership is absolute, and they sh- it should be taken very very seriously. And it's funny because on the ledger in the system itself you can actually take people's coins. The technical part of that is very simple. It's just a couple of lines of code to reassign Bitcoins from one place to another. But the thing that protects that is our competitive, uh, our competitive mining in the system, the, 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 the need for the ledger to be trusted and therefore the competition to secure the ledger better than everyone else. So it is, it is a pure free market capitalist ideal that stops a single line of code from bankrupting somebody arbitrarily. And so it's truly, um, it is truly a competitive free market system. It is the incentives of the system that keep it secure because in a very basic sense, Bitcoin from a software and implementation standpoint is not unique. Like there, there aren't actually unique things about the technology it is just the application. It is the economics. It is the philosophical aspects of Bitcoin that are unique. It is the rules of the game. And I'm going to give you a martial arts analogy because uh, I'm a martial artist. If you look at the parentage of the grappling arts of Japan, or let's even just say the martial arts of Japan, they would call them Budo, which is um, basically the way of combat. So Budo is fight stuff (laughs) in a very basic sense. Now you can break that into two trees. You can break that into the striking arts, which they would call the hard arts, or you can call, or, or the grappling arts, which they would call the soft arts. So this is to punch or kick versus to grab and seize and, and wrestle essentially. But if you look at the different sports, the parentage of things like judo, uh, Japanese jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, and all of these different things. I'm a Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner, so uh, this is lineage that I understand deeply. Judo and jiu-jitsu and Brazilian jiu-jitsu are all actually the same art. They're the same thing. But what defines them is their rule set. So in judo, it is you get points for a very clean throw but you're not allowed to grab the pants and you're not allowed to touch them below the waist until they're on the ground. And so that, that rule set defines how the game is played. Whereas in Japanese jujitsu, which is typically not competitive, it's more so practiced for self-defense and for the art of things. But then in Brazilian jujitsu, it's a much more open rule set. The rule set is basically choke them or joint lock them until they tap out. And otherwise you, you can make your own path to that victory. And so Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is, is very much a progressive art. It grows. It looks like a very different martial art every 10 years than it did the decade before. And it's because there isn't, "Ah, I can't touch them there. I can't do this thing. I can't turn my back. I'll lose points if, and so they, they, they continue to find ways to, Oh, I never thought of this, but when I'm stuck in this position, I can create this wedge and then create this trap and then use this leverage against this person in such a way that they don't expect. But then as that idea propagates the network of other Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners, people develop the defenses for it. And then it becomes the counters to those defensive. And then the the art just continues to grow. And, And Bitcoin is very much the same way. It is a free market system where there are some rules, but they're very they're very limited. Uh, they're also very clear. And since they are clear and limited, you can build whatever you want with the system. You can do something that's very data intensive, or you can do something that is very micro payments intensive, or you can build a business that is based entirely on massive liquidity. And it's really up to you what you can create. And other systems, they, they can't do that. Like I'm not allowed to take U.S. dollars over certain borders. I'm not allowed to take them into certain countries. I'm not allowed to 
do various types of business with them. I'm not allowed to even debase my own. If I tear my dollar, I've committed a federal offense and that kind of thing. And, you know, in, in Bitcoin, um, this is this is why I've always expected there to be an explosion in entrepreneurship. Uh, but right now it's this culture. There is an absurd culture among small blockers specifically that Bitcoin isn't for this and Bitcoin isn't for that. And you're not allowed to do this to the ledger. It's our ledger now. Don't spam the ledger. Don't think about the other people that, that might be hurt by you doing these things. And so they've put themselves in a mental box with rules that you can't break. And then they, they enforce them with their social mores. And this is, this is very much why I'm a big blocker is because I believe that it's a tool. There, there is no licensing agreement on a hammer when you buy it at the store. I can use the hammer to build anything I can think of that can be built with a hammer and maybe something that nobody else has thought of. And that's truly, uh, at least in my opinion, what, what Bitcoin was created for. And I believe that the more we release ourselves from these cultural, uh, this cultural pressure, this peer pressure about what Bitcoin is supposed to do, we're going to come up with things that, that nobody could have thought of uh, prior. And it's, um, it's, so number one, I, I do like the, the martial arts perspective. I've, I've personally been very much a judo uh, guy. So uh, nice. I, know the, I know the difference between having a judo fight and then having a Brazilian jiu-jitsu fight because yeah. there are certain places where a judo fight would just be over. And the Brazilian mm -hmm. Jiu-Jitsu fight is like, eh, let's continue. Right. And, and uh, yeah. it's, it's very yeah. confusing because there mm -hmm. are certain places where I then see, oh, my skill set stops here because there was never a need to continue, which Precisely. is very interesting. Um, but I want to I wanna pick a few of the things you said out and just try to sure. make them explicit because I think you, um, I'm looking for this good ideas, the economic philosophical mm -hmm. ideas in Bitcoin. And I heard you speak of a few things here. So I heard you number one, speak of the worldview, which is not exclusive to Bitcoin, but just that the worldview of, that is built into a system, but then also the worldview that every individual participant brings to a system. And the big question, um, can I, as the technocratic leader of the system, tell you that what your worldview wants to do with my system is okay or not? Or is it basically the question of, you'd bring whatever ideas you have, and all I can say is, cool. Which, which, would, be the, which would basically be the, the protocol is set in stone perspective, is as long as it agrees with the protocol, do it. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that brings up, I mean, presuppositions about what is good or, or what is authority and who, who can define those things. And I don't know, I mean, we obviously don't have a definitive answer, certainly not globally, but um, I think we need to establish a worldview as people and, and Bitcoin established that worldview. Uh, it, it very much planted a flag on, um, you know, the, the notions that freedom is good, that a sound and predictable emission policy on money is good. Uh, that absolute ownership is good and there, therefore, you know, property rights by extension are a good thing, um, you know, and that the simpler they are to enforce, the better. Uh, I think also that uh, reducing, reducing economic friction is good. Um, what else? I, I, think, I think that um, that being able to share data Share, sharing data in a way that is public and publicly auditable is good. And then the flip side of those things would be that, you know, fraud is bad. I think, you know, I, I come from, I come from Chicago and Chicago functions on a lot of, uh, on a lot of fraud. Like there's a lot of crime that happens in Chicago just as a matter of policy that if you move into a certain neighborhood and you open a business, you, you know, you're paying taxes to Chicago and those kind of things, but uh, you're also paying the street tax. Like there are the, the criminal elements of things that control neighborhoods and those sorts of things. And someone will walk in and say, Hey, this is our neighborhood and you owe us this. And, and so Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin establishes that, 
that sort of thing is undesirable because there is no street tax in Bitcoin. Like you will see every payment and every, every bit of coercion and that kind of thing is, is verifiable and it's provable and it stops the sort of secret cash business that, that is allowed to happen or, or has been allowed to happen for many thousands of years now. And then I think the flip side too, uh, to, you know, to property being good, it's, it's the fact that, you know, communal, you know, p- public proper shared property or, or tragedy of the commons sort of things are bad that, you know, that it's a good thing to stake a claim and secure the ledger based entirely on your own rational self-interest that altruism, altruism in a Bitcoin system leads to attack of the system. It, it can lead to things like Sybil attacks and those sorts of things. So, um, you know, it's, it's funny because I, I think the world very much loves the concept of altruism, but Bitcoin is uh, very much establishes that altruism is not desirable. Altruism is a security concern, and then it becomes a concern over the, the validity of your own property and, and, and that kind of thing. So I think those are some of the worldview things that Bitcoin very clearly establishes. Um, I'd like to think that they're obvious and that people generally agree, but, uh, you know, (laughs) which, which is very interesting when you speak about that, because the, the tragedy of the commons. So number one, whoever has not looked at that, it's uh, fascinating because I think as a, as a concept and with all the experiments or behind it, it kills so many of our pretty ideas of how the world should be. Um, Mm -hmm. A lot of the shoulds get killed by the tragedy of the commons and the the game theory behind it, basically. But um, it it brought me to to comparison on one hand, Bitcoin as a ledger being upkept by private companies um, Mm -hmm. versus this idea that there is a government as an Mm. altruistic um, entity that works for the good of everybody by trying to keep up the economy, for instance, through controlling the money supply, the interest rates, the banks, which would be basically on the two sides of that idea of Mm -hmm. property, privacy, um, not privacy, but property and individual incentive compared Mm. to this big nebulous government as the, as the commons basically. Yeah. Well, that's, so that's a really interesting thing too. You know, the, like there's this notion in BTC that, well, every, every person should run their own node. Every person should participate in governance. And I I've fought that idea for a very long time. Bitcoin is very clear that the only governance is your ability to contribute that if you don't like a block, you need to orphan that block and build on top of a different block. You need to be able to mine a block. You need to have hash rate and proof of work. And I think it's funny that the small blocker notion is that it would be better for 50,000 people with a very small amount of incentive to protect the network are actually more trustworthy than someone that may have invested millions in infrastructural cost. Uh, and, and that brings me back to, I mean, the, the introduction of Marxism. I mean, it's a very Marxist thought right there that, well, we can trust the people that work on the factory floor, but we cannot trust the managerial class because their incentives are misaligned. And I, I think it's a, I think it's a, a misunderstanding of human nature. And, and I think it's a misunderstanding of, of how people even want to treat each other. And there are obvious, um, obvious examples of, of bad capitalists, but that flies in the face of, of what we know about the good capitalists. So many good capitalists that, that want to build a better world and want to give products to good people. And when they do that, you know, that they profit from that. And then they have the ability to, produce things better if their workers are happier people and they don't need to be forced to do that. And some, some do, I mean, there are bad business owners, but by and large, you know, a miserable working class is not, not going to be conducive to having a large growing customer base, for example. 
And a lot of this really comes down to philosophy. It's, it's really is a philosophical worldview. And, and this is very much why I say that the BTC people uh, v- very much have a, a, a pretty heavy dose of Marxist uh, narrative that, that undergirds their, their worldview about Bitcoin, that they believe that um, they believe that there's something fundamentally untrustworthy about a large mining pool or, or a large miner, that, that their power for whatever reason is not fair or not earned and that it cannot be trust simply because it's, it's large. And, um, that's, that's a, it's a very problematic, uh, worldview problem in, in, in my opinion. And, and that's really, that's really where big blockers and small blockers differ is that, that big blockers really believe in the power of, I'm going to use the word capitalism again, but they, they believe that the incentives of the invested and, and, uh, industrial class are are what keep the network safe and honest and secure and valuable. And small blockers believe that no, it is it is quite literally that proletariat class. It is it is the uprising of the little person that that brings security and value and everything to to the ledger. So, um, I think if there's a fundamental philosophical reason that big blockers and small blockers split from each other, it really comes down to that. It, it is that you cannot trust the rich, <laughs> and that's. Do, do you uh, have a Do you have a sense of where that notion is coming from? I mean, it comes from the culture separately. I I, I think you know Marxism Marxism is something that has been pervasive since the dawn of the industrial age. Like we. We see people getting replaced by machines, and that scares people who aren't as good as machines. And you know, and, and it's a it's a it's a difficult thing because you can break it down to any one person who's been displaced and made homeless or starved to death, or, and these kind of things, and say, "Well, that's a tragedy," and and it is. It's it's an awful situation for that person, but. If we're designing systems, if we're trying to design systems that benefit the most people and then benefit the culture as a whole and all of these things, it's it's better to be more free. And I, I, it fascinates me how many people say, no, it's better to be managed by smart people or talented people and that kind of thing. Because truly, you know, people understand freedom as it applies to them. Everyone thinks they themselves should be more free but that other people can't be trusted. You know, this is, this is everybody's thing. You know, everybody feels it in their heart that, you know, I'm a good enough person to be, to be given more freedom, more dispensation. And, uh, you know, but I, you know, I don't know if I can trust my neighbors or, you know, or my, my own family or the people I know from my, my real life, like maybe they should, you know, the police exist to make sure I'm safe, you know, that, that kind of thing. And, you know, it's, it's just a, it's, it's a difficult thing culturally to to think about being more free because immediately people think of the worst situations in their lives or the worst example of people abusing their freedom or or, or those kinds of things but yeah you have to zoom out this is just like every other major cultural problem is that if you zoom out and you look at you know how we've moved from having kings to having parliaments to having, you know, some certain pockets where there's just, excuse me, in- increasing freedom. You know, th- those are the things that we want to emulate. Those are the things that I believe Bitcoin was created to emulate and, and actually make easier. It's, it's easier to manage less centrally planned governing structures because of Bitcoin as well. And, um, it's just, it's, it's difficult because I think a lot of BTC people and, and truly like libertarian thought in general, I think a lot of libertarians are actually communists and they don't realize it because they, they, they do have a fundamental distrust of other people's power, regardless of how it's earned. And, and I have, I have a fear for unearned power and power that can't be taken away. I think that's very fair, but I do not fear power that's been earned by people that that can lose it if they don't continue to earn that position of power. And that's another massive, and like that is proof of work. That's the fundamental definition of proof of work. And that's what secures Bitcoin. I, and I, so I want to, I want to slow you down right there because I actually yeah. think that's, that is incredibly 
profound and central to the whole idea of Bitcoin. Um, power has to be earned and power can be taken away. And, and I would wanna add one really important thing. There are honest rules underlying yeah. that, which is, mm -hmm. I think it's, fu it's fascinating that I think honesty is one of, is potentially the word most used in the white paper or one of the words. It, it's not cryptography, it it's honesty. Um, yeah. or honest mm -hmm. and yeah the the thing because if i if i take that small step back to there are people who have a lot of power who have a lot of wealth who have a lot of influence in the economic system i can really get why people would be scared of that because mm -hmm. i think right now we live in a world where there are people in positions of power that have not earned that and where nobody has any possibility of doing anything against it um, if yep. we, so I really get that. And I think that's where this conflation of capitalism and crony capitalism is very much people's lived experience right now, but it's not philosophically the same thing. And I think that's right. a really important distinction. But if we were in a situation where people had to earn their position, their position could be taken away if they didn't continue to perform how they got there. Mm -hmm and the rules were clear and people could check it because the ledger is public that would be a different game than what we see played worldwide right now yeah i mean to to the tune of you know trillions of dollars in money and in just an incredible amount of unearned power i mean we we still have dictatorships. I mean, I mean, look at somewhere like north korea for example. I mean that they, they do not have access to the outside world. Or even if you go like land in Shanghai, go to China, go to China and try to access your Gmail account. You can't do it. Then try to access Facebook and you can't do it. And then try to, you know, you start to realize, wow, this is a completely closed culture. Like they, they don't, they don't even have access without a lot of extra work to see what, what folks like us are doing. I mean, you and I live in the Western world and the Western world gen, genuinely has its own problems with censorship and some of that as well. But but we do have access to each other. You're in, in Germany, if I recall. Yes. And you know, and I'm in the US and we can just, hey man, here's a link. Let's have a let's have a conversation over Zoom. And, and, then, and then we, we can, can transport it and give it to other yes. people. Yes. You know, and and I mean what an incredible thing. I mean mm -hmm. my parents, or I mean, let let's say my grandparents. If my grandparents, when they were our age, if they were, you know, you look like we're about this and we're in our thirties, right? How yes. old are you? <laughs> so 32. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So we're, so we're, we're about, we're about the same. We would have been in the same high school. I'm 35 years old. And so when my grandparents, when our grandparents were in their thirties, they would have never imagined the ability to have a face to face conversation between people that were, you know, five, 5,000 miles apart or whatever, and that kind of thing. And, and, and cross those lines, much less even shoot Germany and the United States and my grandparents' generation were at war with one another. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we, we, we look at these things and say, hey, we, like we have so much in common, even though we come from very different places, we have much more in common as individual people that are trying to compete in the world and, and try to, to build something of value and try to show the world that, hey, I may only be here for... 60 to 100 years but the things that i do matter and i want to propagate my ideas and and maybe even share my my genetics so that they continue to go on after i die and that kind of thing and places like china or or to an even greater degree north korea just don't have that opportunity at all whatsoever it's not something that they can just hop on enjoy and and do freely and and that's a pocket of of control that we see the consequences of i mean th these people i mean what what's the greatest invention to ever come out of north korea <laughs> you know and, there, and there that's... are some there i don't know if you've ever listened to michael malice on north korea if not i can a, really a bit recommend it because I've... there's the north korean Please, opera yeah. which which is a revolutionary because they've moved the choir from the stage next to the stage ah <laughs> brilliant <laughs> <laughs> you know and that's and that's what you see so i mean the more control that you have over a system the more you don't see innovation in 
computer science or, or industrial manufacturing or in communications technology. And, you know, the, these people can barely figure out how to feed a nation of people. And it's, the, the individuals there aren't terribly different. If, if you were to adopt a North Korean baby and raise them in, in Germany, they, they would in all likelihood be a, 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 a normally performing student and adult and they have every opportunity to become you know the CEO of the biggest company in Germany you know and like that's so it's it's not that there's a problem with the people you know genetically or anything else it is it is a problem with the culture and the culture is held down maliciously uh, to the benefit of really a single family and and whoever's connected to the the Kim family and in, in charge there in North Korea and I think that's a fantastic example to show that freedom freedom creates things that can't be created under oppression but there are things that oppression creates too I mean I've, I've known people that have escaped North Korea. I actually used to work uh, sort of tangentially with a, an organization that would um, produce deprogramming videos for people that escaped North Korea. So if they were, if they were able to make it over the border into South Korea, I mean, once they, you know, make sure, Hey, are you, are you healthy? Have you been, you know, whatever, how malnourished are you after making that journey um, to, to put a video together and basically watch for about an hour and explain what the world looked like after the Korean War, because they are so unaware of the outside world. I mean, they, they literally believe things like uh, that the United States has conquered the rest of the planet except for North Korea, and everyone is starving to death. And the only reason it's as good as it is in North Korea is because of the great might of the North Korean military to hold back this, this terrible onslaught of evil people. And, you know, when they see that oh my God, like K-pop exists and, you know, the rest of the world has something like the internet and that there's just, just everything, just everything else, everything outside of North Korea. And the people there are just, they're destroyed by it because their entire world is, is fake. But, but the one thing that that oppression creates is, is a strength that people that you and I can't relate with you know, there's something that made them run past those police that would gun them down. There's something that 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 hunger and and that want can build in you that nothing else can. And so you you generally see those people once they get over their sort of general their shock, the that that post traumatic stress, and and truly the post traumatic stress will stay with them for the rest of their lives. But once they get over the initial like, oh my God, everything is a lie. You tend to see people that have left there appreciate this freedom so much more. And it makes them more able to thrive because they see the opportunity through lenses that you and I can't relate with. And so that's the power of oppression. The, the most beautiful thing about oppression is to pluck people from it and, <laughs> and to see what they're capable of creating. And to bring that back to Bitcoin, this is the other thing that I'm so excited about is that there's about 3 billion people on earth that have zero access to the global economy. They just don't have any access to it at all. They're, they're oppressed, maybe not even maliciously, but they're just oppressed by circumstance and just a lack of access to information or infrastructure, all these different things. And Bitcoin allows people that are born in the middle of nowhere today to, to interact with the global economy in a way that, that wasn't possible to their parents. And it allows them to sell things, hopefully to my children, that my children will want to buy because an entrepreneurial idea came from somebody that, that saw the new world and saw this new technology and said, ah, I'm going to create something with that. And only they are capable of creating it because they knew what it was like to live in a place without electricity or plumbing or, or modern medicine or all these different things. And so there's a massive opportunity there to, to both benefit them, to, to really make the, the, the developing world a, a better place. But the benefit to people like us who live in the developed world is, is to benefit from the entrepreneurship of those people that have been held back uh, up until this point. And, 
the the amount of economic opportunity there really can't be calculated. And and then there's the whole human and spiritual aspect of it too, of you know bringing bringing the entire world out of poverty and with with real efficiency and access. It's just, I mean, it, it's the most exciting thing I think that exists today, frankly, which is why I'm so passionate about it. For me, it. So I have about twenty different places we could go with this, but I think even just talking about the African kid that has the possibility of joining the the uh, the economy, I think this is again coming to that worldview point of mm. adding one person or five people or a one billion people that each individually can contribute to the economy and that the ingenuity, the drive, the possibilities that that brings is actually worth so much more than, than, oh, let's control this. No, you can't put that on chain. It's the, the, the generative effect of including all these humans and human ingenuity and having a positive view on that is actually something that I see very much in the BSV space is this let's include these people because I, I don't even know what they could bring, but it will probably be awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, and, and that's one thing I, I just returned from CoinGeek conference in Zurich and I met a number of gentlemen from the Middle East who are very, very excited to be new representatives to the Bitcoin association and, and bring these ideas to their people. And, the, you know, there's a big difference between uh, people that have lived in places like Lebanon or Iran and some of these places that have experienced a lot of very difficult times over the last generation uh, compared to the people that have lived in, in the UAE, for example. And, you know, Dubai has went from nothing 30 years ago to now, I mean, one of the most incredible bastions of capitalism in the world where you can see what what free markets are actually capable of and seemingly it's big buildings and beautiful resorts <laughs> but and really but, strange islands yes <laughs> yeah yeah gosh the archaeologists of that area are gonna be, <laughs> what happened here so <laughs> but um it, it's 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 incredible though you know i i had a i had a, a meal uh in Zurich with, with a guy from, from the Middle East. And his excitement was incredible. Like he's looking at these things and saying, um, look at the access we can have. He, he developed a, it's an invoicing system. I, I, I forget the name of it, but uh, you know, a way to use the blockchain to, to verify invoices in such a way where there's not a communications problem. And you know, a lot of people, if you don't understand logistics industries, like there's an incredible amount of, of loss just in between people overpaying and underpaying because the communications channels are just slow. And <laughs> when you can fix that problem, it frees up so much capital that can be reinvested into all kinds of things. And, you know, like just to talk to somebody that's just seeing that for the first time reminds me that, hey, I'm not crazy. Cause I'm, I'm so embroiled in it. I just think it's so obvious, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like the, the preacher that, you know, met his first atheist, you know, and I'm like, wait, you know, how, how is this possible? But, you know, to, but to see the conversion, you know, to see somebody say, Hey man, over the last year, I've really looked into it. And the solution makes the most sense for my business for fundamental business reasons. And it really reminds me that that's who we're building for. Like, that's what adoption actually looks like. It's not, Hey, I convinced somebody, you know, locally to go buy some Bitcoin and now, you know, whatever, now we're in the same boat together, but, but really to see someone from a completely different culture with completely different problems and all kinds of different challenges to look at the ledger and say, you know, I, I didn't create an invoice system. That's not what I would, would first think to do, but he looked at it and said, huh, this solves my invoicing problem. And that will allow me to be more profitable and to lose less money and, and to the interact with the economy the way I see fit to. It's exactly and, what uh, you want the logistics person to do. You want the coder to find the problem and you want the logistics person to be like, there is an uh, in, there is ineffectiveness. We can, we can solve that. Exactly. And so, I mean, it's just, I mean, what an incredible opportunity. It, it really, 
it, it can't be overstated how much value there is that, that can come from this technology if it's treated that way. And um, we really need an increasing amount of people to, to really treat it that way, to solve these fundamental economic problems. So, which, which maybe as a last point, because we, we had a one hour slotted in. Um, yeah. You, you talked about the North Korean system. I, I would actually look at that, that even though we're in the Western world and we're seemingly free, in many ways, the way business is done, the way structures work here, we are in North Korea too, we just don't know it. There, mm -hmm. there are so many places where we don't have choice and we don't even realize that we don't have choice. The way banking works, the way certain structures are necessary going to, I wanna have payments on the internet. All yep. I can do is PayPal, Visa, that's about it. Um, mm -hmm. So in so many places, we are not free either. And yeah. actually that's where we can find more freedom, which then will free up so much more possibility in the Western world too. For sure. You know, I've, I've always said you can't, you can't have, like freedom is not on a sliding scale. Tyranny is, but freedom to actually be free is, is an absolute concept. It is, it is, you cannot be 99% free. If you're, if you're 99% free, there's tyranny in your life. Like you're, you're back on the tyranny scale. And that's certainly where we are. And, and, and I actually love that you said that about, you know, Hey, you know, we're, we're on, we're on a scale with North Korea because it's true. It's a weird way to look at it, but <laughs> it is. It, it, it's true though. You know, it, it, it's funny. So I, I went from Chicago to Miami. I spent a week in, in the Miami, Florida area before going to Zurich, Switzerland. And just to see the difference in the way that they're treating their pandemic protocols mm -hmm. is a really fascinating indicator of that sliding scale of tyranny. And Switzerland is very locked down, like, and including, you know, when, when I was there, it was fascinating to see every, you know, Hey, pull the mask up over your nose. Like, you know, and that's the kind of thing that if you, if somebody said that in Florida, I mean, nobody's even wearing masks anywhere in Florida. So they, you know, they look at it and say, ah, only idiots think there's a pandemic. And then you get to Zurich and say, well, only fools would treat this as if it's not a dire medical emergency that needs to be managed by the state. And, and both of those views come from a good place, actually. Like these are people that think they're doing the right thing for other people. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> like, like I said earlier at the, at the beginning of this conversation, that's how Trotsky felt. That's how Hitler felt. This is how Mussolini felt. You know, Mussolini is sitting there and saying, how can I do the best thing for the Italian people? And it, it's, it's very difficult to deal with the fact that, that nobody wakes up in the morning and says, well, I'm evil. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to do an evil thing. And it's what's going to make me feel good. And it's, these are things that creep up on you. These are things that, you know, you look back and say, ah, Maybe I shouldn't. Have, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe I shouldn't have have done these things. And, and we see it even with, uh, you know, if you read the the Nuremberg trials and and stuff about that, and you see these officers that helped manage things like these death camps and stuff that happened in in at the end of World War II. And a lot of them, they look back and and they say, you know, I I didn't I I, I followed policy like this was my job. In, who, who am I to, were I to say no, I would just be put in the prison. I would be shot or I would be put in a labor camp myself. But these are the same thing. This is what the police say too. Like, oh, why did you, why, why did you do these things this way? And it's, oh, it's, it's systemic. It's a matter of policy. It's not me, the individual, but my individual responsibility goes out the window because command structures. And it's like, you know, these are all, these are all things on the sliding scale of tyranny. But in reality, in real life, like these are individual decisions to make. People decide to be executioners and people decide to join the fascist party or join a violent wing of Antifa or, or whatever. You know, they, they decide to be that person to say, I'm going to enforce my ideals with violence if necessary. And then those ideas breed too. And ultimately, um, these are these are attempts 
to reestablish proof of stake and things that, that my idea, my idea cannot be just propagated through work. My, my ideas maybe aren't good enough for people to just understand them and adopt them and for them to grow this way. They need to be pushed. They need force behind them. They need authority of, of the state or the authority of the state that I want to exist. But these are proof of stake ideas. The state is the very nature of stake. That's it. They were here first. You, I was born in the state that I, I live in, you know, and it's, there's nothing to do about it because it preceded me. Their power preceded my existence. And so their authority is that proof of stake. And it's going to take a whole hell of a lot of proof of work to supplant that. And that's another thing that Bitcoin does. This is why Bitcoin is freedom technology, because if we can generate that much more proof of work than they have proof of stake, we free everybody by making their stake obsolete. Things become very silly and then they go away. It's, it's when people laugh at the police, not, not, because, not because they're not a threat now, like this is not a place we're at today, but at some point we're going to look at government authority and say, well, why, 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 why would I consent to that? What, like, you can't do that. And I'll, I'll finish with a church analogy because I love my church analogies. If we go 500 years ago, can, can, there's can, another- Can I just come in quickly before the church please. analogy? Because yes, I think that's, that's a, again, super interesting to basically turn proof of stake, proof of work into fundamental philosophical concepts of looking at the world like that. I've seen you do that a couple of times, but it is, it is an interesting one. Um, Crucial. But I, the, how it ties into the rest of our conversation, just to make that explicit, is if we look at Bitcoin as freedom, and freedom being essentially the individual having freedom to choose, then the freedom is you offer, through your work, you offer something I want to participate in. And if you don't offer that anymore, I withdraw my choice. That's my freedom. Yes. Whereas the proof of stake is to do this, I need to participate in this big pie. And I, can, I have to go to the places that already have the pie. And mm -hmm. once I'm in, I can't get my crumbs that I put in the pie back. So I got to stay in the pie. And yep. that would be the distinction between the proof of stake and proof of work on a monetary level. But from that, it would automatically, because in essence, what we call states nowadays are quite complex money, money systems. Um, so as soon as the money changes, the state would change. The place we live in would change because we would suddenly have choices we didn't have before. And basically what your what the fundamental idea in Bitcoin seems to be and that you seem to be pointing to is giving people more of that choice. And that choice is based on the proof of work. Yep. So my church example, <laughs> <laughs> just briefly. So for 1500 years, let, let's just talk about the establishment of, of Christianity for about 1500 years the church was able to use violence, raise armies, demand tithing as, as a sort of taxation. Uh, they were able to arrest you, imprison you, beat you. All, all of these things were functions of the church. And it's because the church was the main controller of information. Information flowed better through the church than through any other rails. Countries didn't communicate with each other. You know, the French and the Germans and the British and the Spanish, they, you know, they didn't like each other. But the Catholic churches in those countries were able to freely communicate. People would, would send letters and writers and all these different things. And so information was controlled by the church. And it wasn't revolution. There were plenty of opportunities to have revolts and violence overthrow the church, but they didn't work. But what did work, what made the church become voluntary, what made people able to withdraw their consent from the Catholic church was not any one revolt. It was, it was the last revo re revolt that occurred after the advent and the distribution of the printing press. It was when information became liberated, when people were able to print books and disseminate information in a way that broke down the control of information from the Catholics. And ultimately the Protestant revolution or the reformation, but we'll, we'll call it the revolution. 
led to all kinds of other things. It led to the it led to the rise of agnosticism and science and, and all of these different things too. It, it, it created an intellectual competitor and an informational competitor to the Catholic church to the point where today our relationship with the church is completely voluntary. You can go to a Catholic, they still exist. They're still there. You can, you can participate in their governance voluntarily and you can withdraw your consent at will. And it's because we now laugh at the notion that the Catholic church could show up and knock on your door and say, Hey, you didn't tithe this week. You owe us money or, or you've sinned in such a way you're under arrest and you're going to sit in a jail cell at your local Catholic parish. And so the world changes because freedom and information are, are intrinsically bound together It allowed people to function outside of their information silos. And that's the other aspect that, that Bitcoin SV specifically no other version of Bitcoin allows you to compete on that dissemination of information aspect. And so it's a really crucial thing to understand is that if you want the government to actually become laughable, if you want to be able to withdraw your consent from your state, then you need to, you need to remove their exclusive control over the information that they have. And only BSV allows that to happen in a way that can be valuable so that the proof of work can be applied also to information and empower people that in 500 years, our great, great grandchildren will have the same conversation about the state that you and I just had about the church and say, man, can you believe that police could arrest you and put you like, it's just absurd. And so we're on this, this trajectory toward freedom because of Bitcoin, but it's, it's so crucial to get this right and, and to let the proof of work make the decisions about what Bitcoin is and means and does for the world. Thank you very much for this conversation. Absolutely. Thank you, Lucas.